Every successful person got there by going through tough times. Success is a hard-ass teacher who likes to knock you around along that journey. You know, it takes real guts to not give up and keep going. We'll hear stories about failures and how these leaders flip the script to create success. I'm John Schultz. Join me and let's discover how success is never really overnight. So welcome to the John Schultz podcast. Uh, as everyone knows, this podcast uh, talks about with people from lots of different industries, entertainment, sports, business. Uh, my, uh, the way I make a living is real estate. And I'm so happy to have Bob Knackle on today. who's also in my industry. I've known him forever. Uh, we're, it's because we're both getting a little older. We both have our glasses on, uh, when we didn't, when we were younger. Uh, but I think this is, that's true. That's true. That's absolutely true. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Bob. It, it, I could go forever. So I'm going to condense this and then we're going to get into a great conversation. But Bob's been a real estate professional selling properties since 1984, which is amazing. You've seen so many cycles and we're going to talk about some today. Currently, he's senior managing director and head of New York Private Capital Group at JLL. He started his career in 1984 back with CB. Richard Ellis. He founded and co-founded Massey Knackle Real Estate Services, who was the number one building sales firm with Paul J. Massey in 1988. And this is the statistic that I love. Between 1988 and 2014, Massey Knackle closed over 6,000 transactions, $23 billion. And that's when we had like index cards, right? And we underwrote on a piece of paper, but you, you busted through and you, you killed it. And you, I guess, were responsible for almost 18 billion of that, which is incredible. So good for you. You sold your firm in 2014 to Cushman Wakefield and spent years there. And now you are at JLL. Bob, welcome. We are so happy to have you on the John Schultz podcast. John, great to be with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. I'm excited. So, you know, I'd like to go back to young little Bob. You know, we all know Bob now and I've known you for years. And what, what did Bob want to be when, when you were growing up? Like, what was, you know, was it really real estate or was it something else? No, oh, gosh, no. I didn't want to be a real estate guy until freshman year in college. But uh, growing up, I wanted to be a baseball player. Who wouldn't want to play for the Yankees? I mean, come on. I, I love baseball as a kid. Uh, played my whole life. Uh, wanted to be a Yankee. And if, it wasn't, if I wasn't going to be a Yankee, I wanted to be a Ranger. So that was uh, that's those those are my aspirations growing up. And you played through little league through all the way through college, right? Played baseball through college, yeah, and uh, enjoyed uh, enjoyed that very very much. And uh, it's actually where uh, I got my uh, my affinity for statistics. Uh, I was a pitcher and I always kept track of my baseball stats even back to little league. And uh, you know, Mike Stoller calls me the statistician. And I, I've, since I got into the real estate business, I've tracked everything that I've done. Uh, but that all started with tracking my little league uh, pitching stats. You know, it's, it's amazing, right? Because we went through the early part of our careers where information was the oil, the goal. It was what mattered. It was like, how do we get it? How do we show it? And, and how do we accumulate it? And, you know, I remember when I started uh, my brokerage company, you know, CoStar just came onto the scene two years later. I had all my strategies of getting the information properly before that, but that allowed me to compete against the larger firm. So, you know, like loving statistics and information without even knowing it, I think helped you so much in, in how you got started uh, when you were in real estate. But, okay, so you wanted to be the baseball player. So how did your parents influence, influence you as you were growing up? Like, what, what kind? Well, what what did think, you get I, from them? Yeah, my my dad was a high school principal. Uh, thankfully, not the principal of my high school, um, <laughs> because our principal had a kid in our class, and it was it, really terrible for him. Uh, and mom was a housewife, um, so uh, you know they influenced me. I think by uh, giving me a great home to grow up in, teaching me uh, work ethic and do the right thing, and all those kind of things. 
Um, but, um, you know, I stumbled into the real estate business completely by accident. I was, um, you know, at the Wharton School in 1981, freshman year, uh, wanted to be the next Gordon Gecko like every other Wharton kid and drove around northern New Jersey, dropping my resume off at every uh, commercial bank and investment bank I saw. I'm in Hackensack coming out of a Payne Weber office. I cross the hall. I see Coldwell Banker. I walk in thinking it's a bank. Uh, one thing led to another. I end up getting a job uh, there because the banks weren't hiring kids for the summer. Um, took the job, loved it. I was in the market research group, went back my next summer uh, and ran that that summer intern market research group. And then my third summer, I got my New Jersey license and was an assistant to an industrial broker, a guy named Tom Mullaney, who I'm still very good friends with. Uh, and I was showing industrial space to tenants my third summer. And then uh, for whatever reason, I wanted to come work in New York. Uh, as soon as I got done with school, I... I I uh, showed up at CB at 437 Madison, uh, met Paul Massey, and uh, the rest is history. So what made you focus in on sales? Like, do you feel sales can be taught or is it something that we're born with? Because lots of people that go on to go to Wharton and do all sorts of very interesting things, you know, you, you, you went on the sales route, but not only did you go on it, you stayed on it for 40 years. So- why yeah. is that? And what do you think? Yeah, well, as I think I've always liked selling, um, you know, selling yourself, selling stuff, making money. Uh, you know, I was the kid who on snow days uh, would be out at seven o'clock in the morning, knocking on doors, getting 10 bucks to shovel somebody's sidewalk and driveway. Uh, and uh, my first real sales gig was uh, I had two aunts and a grandfather that lived across the street from me. Uh, they bought me a little cardboard storefront that I set up in their dining room. And uh, I would go to the store with them, have them buy candy to put in the store and then proceed to resell them the same candy. So they're actually buying it twice. But that was that was my first uh, my first sales job, really. But uh, I don't know. I just I think when it came to real estate, I just really I love numbers. I was always relatively good with math. And for some reason, I just thought it seemed cool to uh, to sell buildings, uh, figure out what the NOI was, get, come up with a cap rate, come up with the value. Um, so uh, I didn't really give it a lot of thought other than there was something in me that said, you know what, I really like this. I want to do this and I want to do it in the Big Apple. And uh, so I, I you know, was offered a job in New Jersey working for CB. Uh, but I came into New York, interviewed that that uh, junior summer, and uh, they offered me a position. So I kind of knew I had the job lined up when I got out of school and decided I was going to go into the, the Big Apple, see if I could make it here. Uh, and uh, if not, I always could go back to New Jersey. But uh, I, uh, you know, things worked out, fortunately. Well, they absolutely did. All right. So it's, it's amazing because, like, I, I think, you know, if you're, you have a superpower and it's numbers presenting, you know, I, you know, selling, I call it advising or helping someone make a decision, whatever you want to well, call John, it. Also, uh, not to interrupt you, but you, you had asked the question, you know, is sales something you have in you or can it be learned? I think it's a combination. I think some people are natural salespeople. Uh, other people have to work at it, but I think it is definitely a skill that can be learned. And I think it's one of the most important things that you can do. I'm actually working on a curriculum now, which I think should be taught in college on likability, salesmanship. It involves so many different things because unless you are a, a software programmer or an inventor, you're pretty much a salesman. Uh, look at people in our business, whether you're an investor, a developer, a banker, a lawyer, a broker, we're all selling. We're trying to get people to hire us and people generally hire people that they think will do a good job for them uh, and that they like. And so the, the skills of, of likability, winning friends and influencing, uh, uh, winning whatever that the, the, yeah, I mean, people. Uh, the Dale yeah, Carnegie yeah. book, winning friends yeah. and influencing people, um, you know, books on persuasion, uh, books on selling, why people do what they do, uh, how to build a, a, a real relationship with somebody that's based on something fundamental, not, not something that's made up. These are all skills that I think help people in any aspect of life, uh, but particularly sales. So can it be taught? 
I absolutely think it can be taught and I think uh, people could benefit significantly from having that skill set. First of all, I think like even if you're within divisions of a company, you're always, you can call it selling, you can call it presenting, but you're always having to be able, you have to be able to present what you're doing, why it should happen and why people should believe in it, right? And I think with artificial intelligence, social and emotional intelligence skills are going to be more important than ever because a lot of the automation that's going to happen from it, like you saw it happen, like where we had to be the information gatherers, we don't have to be that anymore. We just have to be the presenters of it in the proper way, right? Which is uh, what you're talking about. So I, I agree with you. I hope, I hope you do do that curriculum because I think those skills definitely don't get the focus any way that is necessary. And I think into the future, it's going to matter what, you know, much more. So, so, okay. So uh, you started brokerage, you know, then you, you did well. What made you start a firm? Because it's easier to not have to deal with all the day-to-day -day things of what an entrepreneur or a startup would be. And then, you, but you did it not too long after you, you got into your career. What, what made you do that? Yeah, well, I tell you, we, we wanted to start the firm after two years of being at CB. We ended up staying there four because we didn't realize we couldn't get a bank loan. We, we uh, foolishly walked down to Chemical Bank uh, to try to get a loan to start the business in 1986. Um, and uh, then we found out that that wasn't uh, feasible or realistic. Uh, but the reason we wanted to start our own firm is that uh, there were certain guidelines that uh, that CB was implementing at the time, uh, and it seemed like the the folks that had uh, 20 years of experience that were in our group also didn't want to uh, work by those rules, uh, and so they weren't implemented equally. Uh, and that was something I think when you you set guidelines or rules or parameters or protocols upon which a business is going to operate those rules have to apply to everybody uh, the same. Um, so we, uh, we also, at that time, you know, when we started the business, I was 26, Paul was 28, we didn't know any better. Uh, and if we knew then what we know now, we may not have started the business, but um, we started it. Uh, we thought that there was a, uh, a definite need for what we were doing, as you mentioned, uh, the the quality of publicly available information back in the 80s was not great. Uh, so we devised a territory system that would enable us really to sink our teeth into these different neighborhoods and get to know every owner, every building, every transaction, uh, every zoning change, every everything that was, was happening in a neighborhood that was impacting value. That gave us the ability to differentiate ourselves from all the other brokers and that differentiation gave us a competitive advantage. So and I we, still think you need it. I mean, now the, the information that you can get is there and it's easier, but you still need command of it. Like people want to believe in someone that, you know, has the full boat of, of uh, information for whatever you're selling or doing or helping. So, uh, but definitely was much harder. So that gave you an, an advantage. And I also like how, you know, you're, you're true to yourself, right? Like you weren't afraid to make that jump knowing that it wasn't working for you. Uh, and I think when you're younger, especially 26, you know, that's when you can try all those things. Uh, Cause what's the worst thing that can happen? You can go get another job somewhere else. Right. So I think that was terrific, but you know, you started it and then, you know, it was right around that SNL crisis. And so what challenge, you know, cause first of all, you're too young, guys trying to figure this out. I love the territory system. When I first got in the business, some guy, drew, a friend of mine, drew, drew, uh, put a dot on a piece of paper and said, don't leave that dot till you know every building owner and person in that, in that radius. And then your radius will develop over time. But w what issues did you have to deal with during the times of starting your business? Yeah, well, you know, for, it was very fortunate for us, John, that that actually we started in 88 rather than 86. Uh, stock market crashed in 87. Um, things moved much slower back in those days. Social media didn't exist. Um, and so even though the stock market crashed in October of 87, it didn't really impact the real estate market until 89. Uh, 
Uh, so we start late 88, 89 volume slows to a, to a crawl, uh, 1990 it's bad. Uh, and so Paul and I are looking at each other. Our burn rate in those days was about $15,000 a month. Uh, we had $15,000 in the bank. We had no deals on the contract. We're like, what the heck do we do? How do we keep going? Uh, you know, do we pay 5,000 a month in the most essential bills? Do we pay all the bills next month and just hope something good happens? Uh, we even thought seriously about going to Atlantic City, putting it all on black. Uh, <laughs> and, just, and we didn't think about that. Um, but what we what we thought of is that, hey, we both have pretty good credit. Let's go to uh, to banks and get credit cards. And we got a $3,000 line here and a $2,000 credit line there and a $4,000 line here. Before you know it, between the two of us, we had $60,000 in credit cards. That was enough to run the company for four months. Uh, so we were we ran the company for about a year on credit cards, then got to the point where our credit card uh, lines were maxed out, had no money, um, went to a client of ours who was a Forbes 400 guy, very, very wealthy. We had done a couple of deals with him. We said, hey, we need a $75,000 loan. Can you help us out? And he says, you know, I really like you fellas. Um, I'll give you the 75,000, but I want half the stock in the business. And of course we were completely dejected. We're like, oh my God, we weren't <laughs> expecting that. Um, so we, we slumped back to our, our, our desk and, um, we went to, uh, Paul's stepfather-in-law, Jack Holler, who was, um, was the owner of a mortgage brokerage business out in New Jersey. And said, Jack, look, we, we need 75 grand. We'll give you 25% of the stock in our business. And uh, Jack said, you know what, guys? I uh, really believe in you. I'm going to give you the 75. I don't want the stock in the business. You're going to be very successful someday, and you're going to be upset that you gave me the stock. Uh, we'll be eternally grateful uh, to Jack. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, that uh, he just did such a great, wonderful thing for us. And uh, but for for him, Massey Knackle wouldn't exist because we really had nowhere else to go. I love it though, because you you easily could have just out of desperation made a desperate move, which is go with this person, and you would have it probably wouldn't have been what it is because you would have always been upset on what you had to do to give away so much. Not that sometimes you, you won't do that, but it, I, li I like that you both had the fortitude to keep moving forward and find something new. All right. So, so obviously that happened and you started building this company, right? What were some of the pain points when you knew you had the liquidity to move forward? Deals started happening. You know, people are hard, right? Managing people. So what was some of your challenges growing an organization that really was an information organization, mostly at the beginning, which is people and resources. How, what did you find challenging? Yeah, well, I think one of the, the um, fortunate things for us is that, you know, Paul and I realized right off the bat that our, our assets went up and down the elevator every day. So we were always really good to our people, uh, trying to invest in them with support, training. Um, you know, we, we always, uh, the entire time we had the company, we, we sat in the middle of the bullpen so that everybody could hear us and we could hear everybody. And, you know, that was a, a great thing. But I think the, the challenges more came uh, at inflection points in the history of the company where we had big decisions to make. Uh, and probably the first big one of those was um, when we had filled up all the territories in Manhattan and we had to decide, okay, what do we do now? Do we get into office leasing? Because uh, we can't bring any more sales brokers into Manhattan. Do we get into office leasing, store leasing, finance? And we looked across the river and said, hey, you know what? There's about 54,000 buildings in Queens. Let's go sell some of those buildings. We know how to sell buildings. So we opened up a Queens office uh, in 1998, I believe. Uh, and then shortly after we opened the Brooklyn office, um, and then we got to 9-11 and another big uh, inflection point for the company because from November of 88 through 9-11, uh, we had grown from just the three of us, the Paul, myself, and a secretary to 21 people. Uh, and after 9-11, we saw that companies were downsizing. They were laying people off, really high quality people, attorneys, brokers, accountants. 
Uh, and we went out and hired a director of human resources because up till that time we were both interviewing everybody. Um, and we said, go out and hire all these people. New York is tough. We're going to come back. There's not going to be another terrorist attack. And even if there is, New York's going to survive. It's the greatest place in the world. And within a year, we had hired over 100 people. Uh, two years later, we had added 150 people. Uh, and it could have, it really could have uh, been the death knell for, for the company. But fortunately, the recession in the early 2000s uh, slowed volume a little bit, but it didn't reduce value in any one year. And the market started to take off. Well, we took advantage of that. But that was a very challenging inflection point. It was a counterintuitive move we made, uh, but fortunately it paid off. But what, what pushes you to do that or, for real? Because like most people, when it doesn't feel good, will some will stick their heads in the sand. Some will run. It's like, you know, I think freeze you know, or uh, run. So uh, like what, what drives you in those decisions? Yeah, a lot of it is just a, a, a competitive desire for success. Um, and, you know, one of the things we always look for in hiring salespeople was um, team sports, for instance. Uh, real estate's a team sport. Uh, highly, highly competitive. You work with others, uh, you know, or some type of excellence exhibited in a competitive environment, whether it was captain of the debating team or... Uh, editor of the school newspaper or something where it's a competitive environment, you succeeded. Uh, and it's just that that burning desire to succeed and want to win. Um, you know, Paul was an athlete. I was an athlete. Um, you know, in, in our business, there are multiple times a day you can win, whether it's uh, getting an elusive client on the phone or, uh, or finding out someone wants to sell or getting uh, winning the business in a pitch or getting the contract signed or selling the building. Uh, and those wins all feel really, really great. And, um, you know, especially when it's uh, in a very, very competitive environment, you know, in New York, there are thousands and thousands of brokers um, wanting to sell properties. And we just, we loved that, uh, that competitive environment and uh, wanted to, to succeed in that environment. Now, listen, it, it's, it's making decisions that most people won't during times that are tough. And I, I think it all comes down to belief in yourself and your team, right? Believing you're going to be able to get there. All right. So you had this unbelievable run. I, I mean, $23 billion in sales. You know, you, you built 250 plus people, a machine, right? And you, and you, you, you adopted the technology. Like you didn't just allow yourself to keep your same system and fight the system, you actually move forward in it. And, you know, what makes you want to sell something like that at any one point in time? Like what, what was the decision there? Was it just, you, you got tired of managing people? Why did you do that? No, I, I think, um, you know, the, the intent of, of starting the business was to create something valuable to sell one day. Um, you know, we weren't buying buildings that we could sell one day. We weren't manufacturing anything that we could sell. We were, we were trying to create a platform that would have real value. Um, and we almost sold the business in 2007. We, we weren't thinking about selling. We were approached by one of the big global companies, uh, had conversations with them. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, that transaction didn't happen. But what it did teach us was that uh, when it was time to sell the business, we would likely be on five-year contracts with that buyer. And so in 2007, we said to ourselves, well, gee, Paul is going to turn 55 in 2015. Uh, our contracts will be perceived to have more value if we're in our 50s than if we're in our 80s. So in 2014, if the market is not in the tank, we should really think about selling. So while it looks like we were so brilliant to have sold in 2014, a year in which more buildings sold in New York City than ever before in history, that decision was actually made in 2007. Uh, so we get to 2014 and we're like, hey, the market's chugging along, everything's going great. Uh, we hired an investment bank um, and put ourselves on the market and uh, Cushman uh, needed to have us. You know, they they had a weak capital markets business in New York, 
uh, unbeknownst to us, they were dressing the company up for a, a sale of the entire company and wanted to have a more robust uh, platform uh, on the capital markets front in New York and uh, worked out uh, worked out great for us. So how did it feel from being in? I, I find saying in control is like not a real statement, even because we're never really in control of anything. But how is it coming from running your own business, grassroots, you know, sort of having the way that you think things should be done and then going into some bigger conglomerate? How did you deal with that? Yeah, well, it was a, a relatively easy transition, uh, particularly in the early years, because uh, we stayed in our old Massey Knackle space. Um, you know, the CNW folks were great to us, but they'd come over uh, every now and then and check in, see how things were going. But uh, we were essentially running an autonomous uh, division within the company. Um, and what I'll say is that you know, there are pros and cons to everything. There are pros and cons to having your own business, pros and cons to being at a small company, pros and cons to being at a big company. Uh, and what you have to do is just try to take advantage of the, the benefits that your uh, environment provides you uh, and tune out the stuff or try to minimize the stuff that, uh, you know, isn't exactly the way you'd like it to be. Interesting. So, you and Paul had this amazing relationship and it's not, you don't often see two people. I mean, I have a partner and I feel the same that like fricking frack and we're, we're just so amazing together. So, you know, I get mentorship out of that, but who would you say, and, and what do you, what's your belief on mentors through your career? Have they helped you? Did you seek them out? Did you seek them outside what you did? Like, like how did you go about, creating, you know, your sort of mini board of directors for your career? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that's one of the, the lessons learned. Um, you know, I, I gave a speech at Columbia several years ago, and the, the professor asked me to put together a summary of some of the lessons that I learned. And when I started, I figured, oh, we'll come up with four or five things. Uh, ended up coming up with 26 things. Um, and uh, interestingly, only a couple of them were, were very real estate specific. Um, the rest all applied to any sales business. And some of them were, were much more macro in nature and just applied to life. Um, but I think one of those lessons was uh, to ask older people or more experienced people um, questions uh, and seek them out and try to get guidance from them. We, in the early years, we did way too much by trial and error. And so consequently, you know, we made hundreds and hundreds of mistakes. Uh, fortunately, not a lot of them twice. Uh, but, um, you know, in later years, uh, we formed an advisory board. We had some great people on that advisory board that helped us out significantly. Um, and, uh, you know, learning from people, asking them, you know, have you ever encountered this situation? What did you do in this circumstance? Uh, you can save a lot of time and effort by uh, by learning from experiences that other people have gone through already. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've done, I'm on my, this is like 48 podcasts now, so I've been loving it. And I've been talking to so many successful people that uh, had unbelievable journeys in their careers. And there's this like thread that I keep getting from everyone, which is like not being afraid to ask for help. Like, Help is a soup. Ask for help is a superpower. It's not something that you have to like feel like you're doing it on your own. And when you're younger, because you, I guess you want to prove yourself. But I wish I would have known that too when I was younger. That uh, asking for help and not creating the wheel and not feeling like you have to be the one that you know invents it all. Uh, you, you, you waste a lot of time that you, you might not have. So I think that's a great uh, a great. Uh, I guess that's one of the things on your list. Is there any other thing on the list that you feel sticks out for you in your career uh, out of the 26? No, I just, I think, you know, we, we always say that one of the traits we see in the people who do the best in the real estate business is they really have a passion for it. Um, no matter how good you are, uh, you're always going to run into challenging times and it's going to be really tough. And, and what we saw is the people who really love the business were able to break through those challenges much more easily than folks who were doing it because it was a job or because they thought they could make money doing it or something like that, but didn't really truly love it in their gut. 
Um, and so passion is important. So when I, I talk to young folks today, I tell them, expose yourself to as many things as you possibly can and find out what it is that really gets you excited. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you love what you do, I, I mean, I, John, I feel so lucky selling buildings for me uh, is a job and it's also my hobby. Uh, so I could do this uh, around the clock. If I didn't have to sleep, I could, I could literally <laughs> I do it. I know that about you. I love that about you, actually. That's it's good. No, that's terrific. I mean, so, okay, it's 2023. Here you are. It's your fourth cycle. It's my third cycle. There's a lot of people in the business that have come in that don't know what it's like to be in this down cycle. Where, where do you see this thing going? Where, where do you, where do you, if you're, if you're advising a younger group of people that, you know, 12 years, it's been pretty good. We've had zero interest rates. I mean, it, yeah, if you found a momentum, you know, in any industry, you're able to execute pretty well, pretty easy. Liquidity was there. What do people do in these times when you have to bear down and it's a whole different sort of landscape? Yeah, I think it's, it's important. Oh, the overarching uh, uh, perspective should be, look, the market has always been, is, and always will be cyclical. It's always, it's a constant battle between fear and greed. Um, right now, fear is winning. Uh, we've been from my perspective, kind of living in fantasy land for the last 12 years, because uh, with rates so low for so long, it, it really created, um, you know, a tremendous um, uh, artificial uh, dynamics in certain things. Um, and I don't think that was, was good. Um, you know, we're, we're now at a point where interest rates are more normalized. Uh, lending spreads are very inflated. So I think that as lenders get more comfortable with market conditions, those spreads will come in and that will make lending a little more affordable. But I don't expect a significant uh, drop in base rates uh, unless something globally, a, a very negative global economic circumstance occurs or the fact that we are in uncharted territory. You always have to be careful about looking at the past because the history repeats itself, but it's always a little different. Yeah, 100%. Um, just like when when Keynes came up with his economic theory, um, he he was basing it on a time in which you ran surpluses for some years, then you ran deficits for some years, yeah. then you back to surplus, went back and forth. Um, Keynes never applied uh, his theories to a circumstance where you're running constant deficits. Um, and that's why Keynesian economics does not work in our environment today. Similarly, you know, is our interest rate environment going to be, uh, a, a, is, will it impact things differently because we now have such a high level of debt relative to our GDP? We've never lived in these times before. So is it a new thing? Is, is the government going to have to keep interest rates very, very low? Because otherwise, how are we possibly going to pay our debt service? as a nation. Right. So, yeah. you know, a lot of things to consider. And, uh, you know, th those kinds of things are above my pay grade intellectually. But, but uh, in your pay grade, don't you feel these times is when, and if you're younger in the business or just been in the business and, and you know, want to change the trajectory of it, this is what, like, when things aren't good, people will talk to you more, right? When things are good, no one thinks they need you, right? You're just a commodity, not now, if you have the track record you do, you get a good market share of that commodity, right? But I, I feel that now people want to be educated now. They're scared. If you're living in fear, you want to, you know, get people around you that can help you. So I feel this is a, this is the time where you can recreate, reinvent your career, candidly. Yeah, you, you, know, uh, you, can, you can add real value to a client. Think about it today. You have a lot of people who are having some real challenges in their lives, their, their professional lives. Uh, are they able to hold on to buildings? Should they reposition the portfolio? Are they going to be able to make the mortgage payment next month? There's a number of things that people are really, really concerned about. And think about it um, in your life. When you had challenging times, you always remember the people that were there to help you. When things are good, you don't really remember the folks that were there celebrating with you. But you remember the people who were there for you uh, when you were down. Uh, and in the same way, I think you can build great um uh, great uh, goodwill equity uh, with folks today by giving them uh, the best advice you can, 
uh, and trying to help them through what probably are some of the most challenging times they've ever encountered. I, I totally agree. I, you know, usually like I started my business as a broker. I had a brokerage business when I first started back, uh, you know, a little after you. I started when the SNL crisis actually happened. That's when I got into and served my firm. And I felt it just gave me everyone became on the even playing field at that point. Right. Because you couldn't say, well, I've done this for years because now the whole rule book got thrown out. So I, I do believe like even though it's terrible, you don't want to see people go through what they're going to go through. This is the times that I feel if you want to really get out there and start something and create yourself to the next level, you have a shot. Uh, yeah, John, look, coming coming out of another thing that young folks should really get excited about, coming out of every downturn, there have been a new crop of superstars that have emerged. Uh, and whether that's in the investor field, the developer field, the brokerage industry, attorneys, banker, there are new people that are going to rise to the top. And it happens coming out of every single downturn. Um, and put yourself in a position to take advantage of the uh, the explosiveness that's going to come out of this. And I absolutely believe that the, the real estate market, similar to the economy, uh, is like a rubber band. And now, at least in New York City, the, the investment sales market has been in correction mode since October of 2015. We had a 12-month hiatus, second half of, of, of 21, first half of 22. But for those 12 months, we've been in correction mode. That rubber band is stretched so far down that when it lets go, it's going to bounce back um, with a fury. And I think you're going to see some great things happening in the market. So put yourself in a position today to take advantage of that when it inevitably. Comes yeah, we got down. through a pandemic. We're going to get through this. You know, we got the banking issues right now. You know, we have work from every every there's all these new experiments. And then you got, you know all this other technology breakthroughs that are creating all different dynamics, but it's excite It's an exciting time. So I, I agree with you. And I want, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I know your time is busy. It was fun. People are going to love hearing from you. Uh, so I appreciate it. You got it, John. Always great to see you and uh, let's do a deal. Let's do one. All right.